Hi, my APUSH children. This is Master Instructor Chairman General Thorsten coming to you live from Bunker 167. Today we are going to be talking about the first part of Chapter 27, which are the presidencies of JFK, John F. Kennedy, and LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson. So let's get started. First thing we're going to talk about today is the, night, is the election of 1960, where it's JFK versus Nixon running for president. And in this election, we're going to see a major shift in American politics and how the American population participates in politics, because this is when we start seeing politics on television. So right now we're seeing in the early 1960s, a new generation of Americans. They have more hope for the future. Why? Because they've gotten through a lot of really tough times. They got through the depression. They'd beaten fascism in Europe during World War II. They helped rebuild the world with the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan, uh, basically in the western part of the world, um, especially Western Europe. We had the biggest, as Teddy Roosevelt would call it, stick, which was our nuclear arsenal. We, you know, of course, are trying to speak softly and carry a big stick, and that would be our nuclear arsenal, uh, which was increased under Eisenhower's presidency. And because of what happened in the 1950s, the economy was great, we were prospering, we saw new advances in medicine, and people are living longer and living more prosperous lives. And as you can see over here, we're seeing that people are happy. Yay! So who is this John F. Kennedy character? Well, his full name is John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and then most of his friends and family called him Jack. He was came from a long established Massachusetts family who was very wealthy. Uh, they got their money selling alcohol legally during prohibition. Whoops. <laughs> uh, he was considered nouveau riche, which is just basically a way of saying he came into new money. It They just made it basically when he was um, a child. It wasn't like he had a family of generation, uh, generation of family where generations and generations, they had wealth before that. Um, he is Irish Catholic, and that was something that was actually used against him in the election. And he was our first Irish Catholic president, not the first one to run for president as a Catholic. That was Al Smith in 1928. But that, again, was seen as faux pas to be Catholic because all of our presidents beforehand were Protestant. He also went to many private schools, one of them including included Harvard. And as you can see over here, you can see that he was, that's him serving in the U.S. Navy. He earned many um, in World War II, and he earned many medals, including the Purple Heart. One time he was um, in a really, this is actually a really neat story. He was in a situation where his ship was blown. He basically floated on a life raft, uh, not a life raft, but a piece of the ship to an island where he had to survive a few days on his own, and he actually swam back to save some of his other sailors that he was with that were um, kind of lost at sea. So it's a really interesting story, and he eventually was saved. So what was JFK's political life like? How did he get into politics? He first started as a representative in the House of Representatives as a Democrat for the state of Massachusetts, and then eventually became a senator. He was a representative of the baby boomer generation, and he had many liberal ideas um, and he felt that the government should work for the people. As vain as our country can be, here's a prime example of this. One reason that people liked Jack Kennedy and his wife Jacqueline was because they were very good looking. They were kind of seen as celebrities, and a lot of people just purely liked them based on their good looks. And as you can see in this picture, they look like celebrities coming out of a theater, and they're very good looking people. <laughs> In the 1960 election, JFK's Republican opponent was Richard Milhouse Nixon. He was a long-established Republican politician from California. He pushed for strong political and economic conservatism, meaning he wanted to keep things the same and traditional. He wanted a small government. He did not feel that the government should be big like JFK did. He was for mor traditional morality. He, was, he based a lot of his campaign on moral issues. He wanted tax cuts, and as we learned, with chapter 27, he was strong on communism. He was the leader of HUOC, who was out to get communists in the um, government, in the national government. And also during this time, why, why is this a big deal? Why am I teaching you about Nixon? Well, 
So why was the 1960 election such a big deal? It's considered one of the most popular, um, famous elections in presidential history in the history of the United States. Well, the reason, there are a lot of reasons for that. First of all, it was the first televised presidential debate ever in the history of the United States. And if you watch the debate, you watched it and you saw JFK, he looked handsome, he looked relaxed, he was young, he was confident, looked well-groomed. He had actually been taking some medicine that made his skin a little bit orange, but when TV is pretty much black and white for everybody, he looked very tan on TV. While Nixon had just gotten over the flu and he looked very thin and fragile and he was sweating a little bit, he just looked really sick. Now, if you were to ask people who watched the debate, the poll said that JFK won the debate hands down over Nixon. But if you talk to people at the time who listened to the debate on the radio, the majority of people said Nixon won the debate over JFK. So again, it goes to show how vain our country can be. This is also a very important election because it would be decided by very few votes, by about a few thousand votes. Um, it was a very close election. And actually controversy, and there's a conspiracy behind it, that Mayor Daley, Mayor Richard J. Daley, the older Daley, had something to do with Kennedy winning the election because in Chicago, he helped basically add some votes to Kennedy's side of the ballot. But the two candidates, they had very different views on how the direction of our country was going. With Kennedy, he felt like we were going in the wrong direction, that we faced some serious threats abroad, and he felt like that we needed to spend money to help the Americans at home and also to help um, divert Cuba from becoming communist. Nixon said, no, we're just fine. I was vice president under Eisenhower for the past eight years, and we did great. We fixed this country. The economy's doing well. The thing that I feel like we should do when I'm president, he said, was to cut spending because we're just spending way too much money at home. So like I said, the 1960 election was won by JFK by just a few thousand votes, and now it's time for his presidency starting in 1961. It will be known as the Age of Camelot because JFK was seen as the King Arthur who was going to lead with his Excalibur into a young, ambitious new presidency with many new changes under his belt. In the 1960 election, JFK was elected by one of the narrowest margins in American history. When he was elected, he was elected the youngest president in American history as well at the age of 43. Now, the youngest president to ever serve was T.R. He was 42 when he became president, but he wasn't elected president. He took over after the assassination of William McKinley. He was also the first Catholic president and still to this date is the only Catholic president we have ever had. And when he assembled his cabinet, he had many young members of his cabinet uh, that were many of them were from Harvard, just like he was. Uh, one was the two most famous members of his cabinet, the first being his brother, Robert F. Kennedy, was his attorney general. And his Secretary of Defense was Robert McNamara, who many feel has been one of our greatest Secretaries of Defense, but at the same time, he's been critiqued for his um, tenure as Secretary of Defense because of what happened in Vietnam. All right, just like Truman had his fair deal, FDR had his new deal, the program that JFK called his domestic program was the New Frontier. It had many bold new ideas that he wanted to reform, including education, welfare, health care, elderly assistance, fixing the inner cities. And a lot of these ideas that he had were just a continuation of what FDR did with the New Deal. But we're going to see that he's not going to be as successful as implementing them as FDR was. What type of problems did JFK have during his presidency? Well, one of his biggest problems that caused all of his other problems was that he really did not have much support in Congress. Now, granted, it did have a Democratic majority, but the Democrats were split into two separate groups, two separate factions. We've got the liberal Democrats, which is what Kennedy tended to be, and which are what the Democrats are like today. And then we have the conservative Southern Democrats who actually have shifted over to the Republican Party to, in today's day and age. Um, also, people didn't really support him. They were a little nervous to support him since he won by such a narrow margin of victory in the 1960 election. He was also having problems with foreign countries like Russia, Vietnam, China, Cuba, and some other areas. So he had to focus more on those rather than his domestic program in the New Frontier. So most of his programs 
will not pass. And we'll see that in the next uh, upcoming years of his presidency. But I want to make it clear that everybody assumes that JFK was one of our greatest presidents of all time. They got so much done for this country when in all reality, most of his stuff is not going to come to fruition. One thing that uh, JFK was able to accomplish during his presidency was to get Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren nominated and approved by the Senate. Uh, he was actually considered conservative, but in all reality, he became a major uh, judicial activist on the court, meaning that he made a lot of new precedents with decisions that he made that had to do with civil rights during this time period. What were some of the major decisions that were made on Warren's court, as they call it? Well, there were several cases that have been considered some of the most um, controversial, but also some of the most important cases ever decided under his watch. Um, one of them would be Baker versus Carr, which changed voting laws all throughout the country. Another one was Gideon versus Wainwright, which extended the right to legal counsel to state cases rather than just at the federal level. Uh, Escobedo versus Illinois and Miranda versus Arizona were rights of the accused, basically the right to remain silent during any type of arrest. That was a major issue that is still important today. And the Engel versus Vitel, which said that you cannot have prayers in school that violates the First Amendment. And Griswold versus Connecticut, which overturned the ban on birth control. These are all major court cases. Under Warren, another one that we're also going to see later would be Roe versus Wade, which allows uh, illegalized abortion. Uh, like I was talking about before, JFK really was never able to get his New Frontier domestic program off. So he really had to focus more on his foreign policy. So he was actually pretty successful at that with dealing with the Cold War. So we're going to talk about today how he dealt with the Berlin Wall being erected, also about how there was the deployment of Russian missiles in Cuba, among the other things like the Cuban Missile Crisis. Eisenhower had the idea of massive retaliation, as we know from the previous chapter, but we are now seeing with JFK a new style of dealing with the Cold War called flexible response. He felt that our nuclear arsenal wasn't enough to be able to fight off communism. He felt that we had to use conventional warfare to fight off communism. So he came up, like I said, with the idea of flexible response, which moved back towards the conventional type of warfare rather than the nuclear arsenal with massive retaliation and brinkmanship. One of JFK's uh, successful foreign policy ideas was the Alliance for Progress, which was basically considered, in this very unpolitically correct way of saying it, the quote-unquote Marshall Plan for Brown People. Um, it was made to give $20 billion to support to internal improvements like infrastructure to help build schools and hospitals and help distribute land to those who were in dire need of help. Um, it did help some, but at the same time, there was so much abuse and corruption to the program that it didn't entirely work out too well. Probably JFK's most crowning achievement would be his development of the Peace Corps. It was basically a program for volunteers to go around the world into certain areas of major poverty to help specialize, help the people there specialize in certain areas like education, agriculture, irrigation, um, infrastructure to make their communities that were in terrible disarray make them much better. Um, it also was used as a way of containment to promote democracy and the American lifestyle. So any place that they went to, we were hoping to stop communism from being a choice in that area. JFK was the president that really pushed for us getting into outer space, getting the first man on the moon, so he was a big promoter of NASA. Uh, one of the things that did happen under his presidency was that John Glenn in 1962 was able to be the first man into outer space, but we didn't actually get anyone to walk on the moon until 1969 with Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins being the first men to walk on the moon with the Apollo 11 mission. Unfortunately, JFK wasn't alive to see that, but he still really is credited to getting our men to be the first men on the moon. The next thing I'm going to talk about is considered one of the biggest uh, faux pas, I guess you could say, of JFK's presidency, but it wasn't really technically his fault, and I'll explain why that is. It was known as the Bay of Pigs invasion. Now, what happened was Fidel Castro, who had overthrew uh, Cuba and turned it into a communist regime in the 1950s, 
And he was starting to get a little cozy with Nikita Khrushchev, who was the leader of the USSR. Now that made us a little nervous because if you don't know anything about geography, Cuba is 90 miles south of the southern coast of Florida. So they're a little too close for comfort. And we realized that we needed to get this guy at office. And it was one of those things that we saw Truman doing, and then especially Eisenhower trying to use the CIA to do covert operations in order to overthrow dictators or leaders of other countries that we didn't really approve of. So once Eisenhower left office, the CIA basically said to JFK, hey, we're doing this. We already had a plan. And reluctantly, JFK agreed to allowing the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was basically a way for the CIA to work with um, Cuban exiles to overthrow the Fidel Castro communist government in Cuba. So on April 17, 1961, JFK decides to launch the Bay of Pigs invasion. It was led by the Cuban rebels known as the La Bragida, and they were going to try to overthrow Castro and his communist government. Well, they run onto a coral reef, so they don't even land in the right spot they were planning on in the area of the Bay of Pigs, which is in Cuba. And at the last second, JFK calls off his air support. And when all is said and done, it is a major, major failure because Castro knew about it, caught wind of it, and killed at least, killed either or captured about um, 1,400 of, all 1,400 of the young Cubans in the La Bragida. So it was a major failure, and it was not only a failure for the Cubans, but it was also a failure to, for the Americans because the CIA was exposed of their covert operations that they've been running around the world. Pretty soon after the disaster, the Bay of Pigs invasion, Khrushchev and the leader of the USSR and JFK decided to meet to talk about how many of the Eastern Germans were fleeing into either Western Berlin or West Germany and JFK said that he still was going to fully support those refugees and help them. So in retaliation, Khrushchev built the Berlin Wall to block the eastern part of Berlin from the western part of Berlin. And that is going to exist until 1989. Berlin Wall, Berlin Wall, this is a picture of the Berlin Wall. Kind of scary and really big. Got built after the Bay of Pigs. This event I'm going to talk about next is considered one of JFK's most crowning moments in his presidency, the diversion of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now what happened was an American spy plane had flown over Cuba in October of 1962 and discovered that there were Russian or Soviet missiles that were on the northern edge of Cuba. And we knew what that meant. They were aimed at us, they were coming at us, and if you could see at the map above you, you will see where they were actually located according to Cuba and you can see the southern tip of Florida were not very far away. So why did Khrushchev do this? He sent them missiles, he sent them nuclear missiles for a couple reasons. Number one, they were his allies. Number two, he was mad at JFK for not uh, throwing in the concessions with Berlin and he was also mad because we had started putting weapons in Turkey which was very close to the USSR so he felt if they're doing that we're going to do that to them by putting missiles in Cuba aimed at them. Now, this is what's going to begin a long 13-day process of intense negotiations and different types of strategies to try to avoid this conflict. This is one of the closest times that we have been at the brink of nuclear war. So what was JFK's plan with uh, averting this crisis? Well, he decided to set up a naval blockade blocking any ships that would be going into Cuba or into Cuban waters and blocking any supplies, whether it be military supplies or just consumer supplies that would be going to the country. And this, there's a problem with that though because it was kind of seen as a direct act of war against the Soviets by doing this. But then again, we said, well, having the missiles on the island is a direct act of war. So it pushed us to the brink. And the scary thing is that if any ships were to actually come in past the blockade that we had built, the Navy was told to fire upon those ships. So it was very scary because there were some Soviet ships that came very close to that imaginary line that we drew with the blockade that we would have had to shoot them down. Luckily, it never got to that point. So by October 28, 1962, the crisis had been averted 
the Soviets agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba while the United States agreed to move, remove their missiles from Turkey. Um, but there were some problems with this. Khrushchev, because of the situation, was forced to resign from office. And he was one of our biggest allies, I guess you could say, if there ever was one in the Soviet Union. And Brezhnev, who takes over after him, is pretty Stalinist, and that is a little bit scary, we're going to see. Um, also, during this time, there were some things that came out. They, we were trying to make an agreement with them to ban um, ICBMs, and that really didn't happen, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and that really didn't happen at the time either. Um, but there was the red phone that was installed during this time, which was basically the direct link from the United States to the Soviet Union in case there were ever a crisis like this again. Unfortunately, on November 22, 1963, one of the greatest American tragedies happened in our history. That was the assassination of John F. Kennedy in the city of Dallas by what has been told to be, according to the Warren Commission, just Lee Harvey Oswald by himself. So immediately following that, we have LBJ Lyndon Baines Johnson take the oath of office and he becomes our next president. And we're going to look at his presidency now with um, his domestic program, the Great Society, but also his involvement, his escalation of our involvement in Vietnam. So what was LBJ like as a politician? Well, he was, he's very experienced. He had been a long running politician, first in the House and then in the Senate. And then obviously he became vice president. He was from Texas. He's a Southern Democrat. He was considered conservative at first, but then when you see his Great Society program, he seems a little bit more liberal. He was known for having amazing tactics to convince people on siding with him. He built coalitions basically through different things like being strong armed, just coercing people into what he wanted, basically not listening to a single word they said and doing whatever he wanted until they basically gave up and said, all right, we, we'll just have your way. He also would get into your face like this, as you can see with this picture and try to intimidate you and make you feel very, very uncomfortable until he finally got his way with you. And as you can see, you probably don't feel comfortable with me doing this with you right now. And that's what he did as well. So I'll back up a little bit because it's kind of creepy. So as I said before, he was immediately sworn in as president of the United States and he decided to continue JFK's legacy by promoting his social programs and domestic programs through his great society. LBJ used his political experience to help get his Great Society passed. There were many things that he pushed for. One was to fight poverty, and he called it the War on Poverty. So what did he do? He started the Economic Opportunity Act, which coordinated and helped push for economic recovery, especially in poor areas. He created the Neighborhood Youth Corps, which basically helped youths graduate and get jobs once they were out of high school. Um, he also provided job training through the Jobs Corps, and he created VISTA, which was basically like the Domestic Peace Corps, helping those in, specialize in certain areas and certain communities that needed the help in the United States. Two of his most notable achievements came, though, in the area of national health care. He created, both in 1965, Medicaid, which was to aid those who were in need, those poor who were poor, and also, he created Medicare, which was assistance to in healthcare with to anyone over the age of 65, no matter what their need was. These two programs still exist today, and actually, one of the biggest controversies right now is going with the bankruptcy that is going on with Medicare. He also did a lot with the Great Society to help education and the environment. In 1965, he funded, he helped fund Project Head Start, which basically gave money and to preschool programs in inner city for those who were poor and could not afford it. He also helped pass the Water Quality Act and the Clean Air Act in 1965, which basically was meant to help the environment. People were starting to look around themselves and see how disgusting the environment was looking, and that's really what started the environmental movement, and he went with it. Also, during LBJ's presidency, he did a lot for civil rights. Can, he passed two of some of the most, what are considered the most um, forward and significant civil rights acts in American history. The first being the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which basically banned any type of discrimination in any way, shape, or form across the United States. A year later, in 1965, he passed the Voting Rights Act, which 
did the same thing, but was specifically for voting. You couldn't discriminate in any way, shape or form, state or federal level, it didn't matter. Um, he also created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is a way to help bar discrimination in the workplace. And as you can see in this picture, he did work closely with Martin Luther the King to try to figure out what to do for civil rights and to integrate the black community into society as an equal entity rather than just being separate black and white. We're now seeing them all being treated as equals according to law that was passed by LBJ. So what was LBJ's legacy? Well, surprisingly enough, a lot of people assume that JFK was one of the greatest presidents and did so many things for us. Well, vicariously he did through the legislation of LBJ. LB, if JFK was alive, I don't know if any of this, all of these programs that he got passed would have gotten passed because of the fact that he wasn't using the coercive and political tactics that LBJ was so shrewd with. But he did get some things passed. He did and um, he did get past entitlement programs like Medicare and Medicaid and anything to help those who were in need, also known as kind of cradle to grave policies, helping those from when they're born to when they're dead. Um, he also did at the same time, you got to pay for these things. So this, the debt, um, national debt skyrocketed, but it wasn't just because of these domestic programs. It was also because the money he spent on the Vietnam War, which we'll talk more about that later. Um, he was distracted from his domestic issues. He pretty much had to give them up like most presidents do because of the war. And you're going to see that again when we get into the Vietnam War with the next part of this unit. Um, there were a major rise in protesting under his presidency against the war, against losing freedom of speech. And um, we're going to see that that's going to cost him a re-election bid coming up in 1968. But other things that got done well during this time, he provided more housing for inner cities. He did help push some of the biggest and most important civil rights legislation in American history passed through Congress, through him, and integrated. So that's the end of this part of Chapter 29. I hope you have a nice night. Goodbye.